Okay, good morning. So thank you for being here early again. My second favorite subject, capsule bag opacification. So again, we have a laboratory at the fourth floor that I could direct with Nick, and then we have Nathan and Joshua as fellows, and both of them are here today. That's very nice. So before we go into the subject, just a small uh, introduction, because we have to know where posterior capsular opacification comes from, right? So this is the normal uh, histopathological structure of the crystalline lens. Then you have here the anterior capsule, the posterior capsule, the equatorial region of the bag. And we have a monolayer of cells, at the E cells at the equatorial region. They are in continuity with the A cells at the inner surface of the anterior capsule. And then what happens is that those cells, they do not behave exactly in the same way. So when you have surgery and you disrupt this structure, the A cells that are residual inside of the capsular bag, they have the tendency to remain in place and then they undergo transformation. They proliferate in uh, multi layers and they start producing collagen. However, the E cells, they have a tendency to actually migrate and they are going to sit at different places, including on the posterior capsule. You see that normally on the posterior capsule, you do not have cells. So they migrate there and they become bloated cells. They start forming the pearls, alginate pearls. So these two cell types are the uh, cells involved in the process of posterior capsule opacification. And actually, we will go beyond that. We are going to talk about opacification within the capsular bag. Because when the residual anterior capsule opacifies, this can also be problematic. And that's essentially a fibrotic entity. However, when we talk about posterior capsular opacification, you may have a mixture of pearls, proliferation of these E cells, and also a fibrotic component. So again, these are the cell types involved in the different process, and today we are going to be talking about posterior capsular opacification, but also anterior capsular opacification, and I'm going to end with what we call interlenticular opacification, that's opacification between two intraocular lenses if you put both of them in the capsular bag. So there are many advances in surgical technique, IOL design, materials, everything helped in decrease the incidence of posterior capsular opacification, but it is still a major cause of decrease of visual acuity after cataract surgery, and depending on the time you consider, it can go up to 50%, which is really important. And of course, you can treat this with the AG laser. You all know that. You do a posterior capsulotomy with the laser. It's relatively uh, a simple procedure, but it's not without risks. You could have IOL damage. Look at the spitting. You could have subluxation, dislocation, retinal detachment. You could have secondary glau glaucoma, etc. It's also a very important cost to the um, healthcare system. So, but nowadays we cannot just think like in a simple way, okay, you can do YAG and that's it. You have new intraocular lenses with new properties. You have premium IOLs and you have development of different uh, projects related to accommodating intraocular lenses. And mostly these lenses are designed to be moving within the capsular bag. So then you cannot have opacification and fibrosis inside of the capsular bag. There's so much research going on in posterior capsular opacification, including the basic level. My subject of my PhD thesis was to coat intraocular lenses with Teflon. It was extremely cool, and it worked so well in uh, cell culture, and then when you go to the rabbit model, it's really a different thing. There are some antibodies that they link to the IOL to prevent that, some coatings. I mean, there is a lot in terms of basic research to prevent that. However, nothing is really 100% effective, so we are still researching many things. However, in the meantime, what you, as you're going to be surgeons, what can you already do to help prevent this complication? So Dr. Apple actually described three surgery-related factors that really help in preventing the complication, or at least decreasing the rate of the complication. And we are talking mostly about posterior capsular pacification here, hydrodissection enhanced cortical cleanup, 
in the bag IOL fixation and a small capsule rex so the edge will cover the periphery of the optic for 360 degrees to form the shrink wrap around the IOL. We are going to discuss about one by one. However, I want to show you these are from cadaver eyes we get in the lab. And before we had these factors, that's what we would normally see. You have asymmetric fixation in the bag and in the sulcus. You can see a lot of posterior capsule pacification. You can see a lot of decentration. And then when you got those factors applied by the surgeons, that's what you see. So it looks already much, already much, much better. But there are still ways to improve that. Okay, so let us start with the first one. Hydrodissection enhanced cortical cleanup. So this is mostly important to remove all of this cortex and the E cells at the equatorial region of the capsular bag because PCO comes from proliferation of anything that's residual inside of the bag. So if you leave a lot during surgery, you are going to have a lot of PCO. And in terms of research, of course you do that with BSS, but there is research using different solutions to do that. So uh, we tried in the lab one time preservative-free lidocaine, and there are some antimitotics that were tried with some success. Of course, the problem here you can see is that you're injecting these solutions in the eye, you may have some toxicity, right? So you have to be careful with that. So uh, that is mostly to eliminate the cortex, the E cells. Is there a role if you eliminate the A cells attached to the inner surface of the um, anterior capsule if you do extensive polishing? So that was um, researched by different people and they observed that indeed you improve anterior capsule pacification because you're eliminating those cells that are going to form fibrous tissue. However, they could not find any difference in terms of posterior capsule pacification if you do that. And actually Dr. Spaldon believed that we should not polish a lot the A cells because it would be good to have these cells proliferating and forming some fibrous tissue. You see that's the anterior capsule here that's opacified where it keeps contact with the IOL. And then this will contract the bag and will push the optic posteriorly to enhance the barrier effect of the optic in contact with the posterior capsule. So he believes that's actually a good thing. So we tested different things in the lab. We tested this uh, epi loop with this wire that goes all around the capsule bag. And instead of doing hydrodissection, you use this wire. And it's really very interesting. And Alan Crandall right now is using a similar device. And he uses that not only for this, but also to crack the nucleus. So that could be quite interesting. We did some studies and we could demonstrate that you clean the capsule bag as effectively with this device as with the uh, hydrodissection. In the past, we tested this sealed capsule irrigation system. It was very interesting. It's a silicone device. After you finish to evacuate the capsular bag during cataract surgery, you put this in front of the capsular rexes and you seal the, the capsular rexes. So basically, you have an inner compartment of the capsular bag that's sealed. And then you can inject any kind of solution to treat that capsular bag and you do not have the problem of toxicity. That was all very interesting, and here is with a dye to show that it doesn't leak after you seal. They try different things, including just distilled water, because if you put distilled water, any cell is going to, by osmosis, is going to, to explode. So you can see the difference here in terms of anterior capsule pacification. There is no fibrosis here where they use the device. However, in some studies, they could not demonstrate any effect. And what's the major problem here is that you have a cataract surgery procedure that's like 10 minutes, and then you have to add a device like that, irrigate and everything. You add another 10 minutes, so nobody really wanted to do that. That was a pity because it was really very cool. We tested also something very, very interesting, the photolysis system. It's a modified YAG laser. So again, when you, you evacuate the capsular bag by irrigation aspiration, you get that probe and you start lasering the inner surface of the capsular bag. This German surgeon did that in these patients. He did on, on the right side only to show the difference. And it was so interesting because with time, on the left side, he had anterior and posterior capsular pacification, but it's like stops in the middle, and in the right side, you do not see anything. 
So this is really effective. And we tested in cadaver eyes, and you can very easily see when you remove the lens epithelial cells, the residual lens epithelial cells. But not only that, you also remove fibronectin or any protein that's used as a substrate in the capsule to, for the cells to attach and to grow. So again, very effective, very interesting, but the same story. I mean, you have 10 minutes surgery, this is going to add another 10. So it's pretty much abandoned, which is a pity. But all of this shows that if you eliminate all the cells, or at least the majority of the cells, you really slow down this process a lot. What about in the bag IOL fixation? That's extremely important. Any study you're going to check in the literature will tell you that a posterior chamber length should be inside of the capsular bag for PCO prevention. Because if you have the IOL fully in the bag, you are going to have the optic in contact with the posterior capsule, and that acts as a barrier for the cells that comes from the equatorial region, and they have the tendency to migrate to the posterior capsule, but they stopped right there. However, if you have an asymmetric fixation with back and sulcus, in the side where the haptics in the sulcus, there is a free avenue for those cells to come from here to grow behind the optic. So that's where the IOL should be in terms of posterior uh, chamber IOLs. And the last factor is the capsulorexis. The majority of studies you are going to check in the literature will tell you that the capsulorexis should ideally be smaller than the IOL optic, centered, so the edge of the rexis will cover the periphery of the IOL optic for 360 degrees. And if you do that, you're going to have better results in terms of posterior capsular pacification. This is a very important study that was done here. And um, they, with different IOLs, they compared eyes that had the complete overlap, meaning 360 degree coverage, versus incomplete overlap. And in all cases, they found if you have a complete overlap, you have better prevention of posterior capsular pacification. The majority of studies will show that there are very few exceptions, like this study here could not really show a difference, but the great majority will tell you that that's what you should have. So with the standard IOLs, again, you have the IOL inside of the bag, smaller rexes, shrimp wrapping the capsule around the IOL optic. That's a very important concept for standard IOLs. Later we are going to discuss about totally different concept that we are seeing in the lab. Okay, but not only the surgical technique is important. I mean, the IOL is also very important. Of course, it has to go together. You can put the best IOL for PCO prevention, but your, if your surgery is not good, there is no way the IOL alone is going to act preventing the complication. But what is important to have in the IOL to prevent posterior capsular pacification? So people talked about the material. It would be good to have, a, of course, a biocompatible material that you do not stimulate inflammation, but the material should have some adhesive properties to stick very early to the capsule. Anything you can do to the design so the IOL optic will have a very good contact with the posterior capsule would help prevent posterior capsular pacification. And again, I'm talking about standard lenses. You can do that, for example, by putting an angulation so the optic is moved posteriorly. And the most important factor is the square optic edge on the posterior optic surface. So again, let us check one by one. So we studied with Dr. Lee Nola. He had this uh, sandwich theory that was very interesting. And he proposed that if you have an IOL with a bioadhesive bio surface, this would allow only a mono layer of lens epithelial cells to attach to the capsule and the IOL, which will further prevent any proliferation inside of the bag. And we tested this with him by using cadaver eyes implanted with all kinds of different IOL materials. And what was observed is that fibronectin is a protein that's readily available in the acosumer after surgery. And some materials, some IOL materials, would bind to this protein much more than other materials. So in our tests, we saw at the time the hydrophobic acrylic lens available was the Acrisoft material and the binding to uh, fibronectin was much superior than any other material, meaning that that material really sticks to the capsule much better. And he proposed that that would prevent PCO. 
It turns out later that the most important factor for the IOL to prevent PCO is really the square edge, but the material may have mostly an effect on anterior capsule opacification. And what we are seeing here are histopathological sections cut at the level of the anterior capsule. You are seeing here the capsular axis edge, and you see here in some cases nothing or just a monolayer of lens epithelial cells and with other cases a very thick fibrocellular tissue in the inner surface of the anterior capsule and that's when uh, this fibronectin and this adhesive theory uh, makes really effect. So what we observed is that with some materials you have much less anterior capsule opacification than others. The worst was the old silicone lenses that were plate type design. And you can see the lens is in total contact with the anterior residual capsule and it's completely opacified where it keeps contact with the anterior capsule. Notice here also the whole anterior capsule that's residual there is actually clear, but wherever it touches the IOL, it's opacified. So it's, it's used like an index of biocompatibility, actually. And what's the problem with anterior capsule fibrosis? In the past, people would not consider that much also a problem with the standard IOLs. It was just a problem when you had excessive fibrosis, asymmetric fibrosis, things like that, like a phimosis of the opening of the capsular axis, and you had IOLs with very flexible loops, and that would lead to a very extensive decentration of the intraocular lens. So that was a big problem. However, again, nowadays you cannot think like that, because in our lab we are working with a lot of projects for accommodating intraocular lenses, and mostly these lenses are designed to be flexible, it should be moving inside of the capsular bag to mimic the accommodation. So if you have a capsule bag that's fibrotic, this is not going to work. So we cannot just think like that anymore. So how can we prevent this fibrosis and especially this anterior capsule opacification which is essentially fibrotic? So we learned a lot with this project that was a dual optic silicone accommodating intraocular lens. Very good project, AMA, AMO bought it and then they abandoned the project and that really worked. There were some clinical studies done here and the patients were actually quite happy, but they figured it would cost so much to continue that they unfortunately abandoned. But we worked a lot because this um, design had very interesting aspects. So the lens had these eyelets on the anterior optic and then the anterior capsule would not be in total contact with this silicone optic. The contact would be very limited. And also the whole IOL being dual optic would keep the bag open and very expanded. So we put this in the rabbits and then it was so interesting that not only there was no posterior capsule opacification and you can see in comparison to the control, but there was also no anterior capsule opacification because if you do not have contact between the IOL and the anterior capsule, the anterior capsule actually does not opacify. So later we are going to discuss about the problem of interlenticular opacification that may happen between two lenses if they are in the bag. So with this design, of course, you have two optics. We were worried about that. So we tested in rabbits, but it turns out that this is really a problem with two hydrophobic acrylic lenses such as the Acrisoft that has this adhesive surface in the bag. So this was not at all a problem with silicon type of lenses. So the last aspect of the IOL design is the square posterior optic edge. That's really the most important. And it has been incorporated in the great majority of all IOLs that are called modern intraocular lenses. And some of them, they have square edges everywhere, anterior and posterior surfaces, and single piece lenses may have it even in the haptics. The importance here is really the posterior optic surface. So again, uh, don't forget that even for these square edge optic IOLs to really function nicely, they have to be full in the capsular bag because uh, if they are out of the bag, you still have proliferation. But here you can see a better barrier effect of the optic that has a square edge 
versus an optic that has a round edge. It's much easier for the cells from the equatorial region to gain access behind the IOL optic. And again, it has to be in the bag. Even a very good square edge, if it's not in the bag, it's not going to act as a barrier. And the square edge is very important, does not matter really the material. So at the beginning, people thought, okay, is the hydrophobic acrylic with the square edge that makes the difference. Not at all. There are very good silicone lenses with a very square optic edge, and those lenses perform really well in terms of posterior capsular pacification prevention. Here you have, oh yeah, Mike, you're here. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> So here you have round edges, IOLs, and you see the posterior capsule here being very opacified or with a huge YAG laser here. And here you have a lot of summaries ring. So the summaries ring is the proliferation of these E cells at the equatorial region of the capsule bag, and that's what it grows behind the IOL optic and opacifies the posterior capsule. So there is a huge summaries ring everywhere here, but the posterior capsule is perfectly clear because of the barrier effect. And what you're seeing here is fibrosis of the uh, edge of the capsulorexis, okay? So I spent some time in Germany, and then we did very interesting studies there because this square edge became such an important thing, and then suddenly all companies were stating they had square edge IOLs, but then the results of the clinical studies were not really showing a comparable level of prevention of posterior capsular falsification. So we are like, okay, but who is controlling if they are really square? Is that someone controlling? And then we figure out that nobody was really controlling. That was very interesting. So we came up with this idea to get IOLs in the market that were sold as square edge IOLs. We got some specific um, diopters, and we got a very standardized way to evaluate these lenses under scanning lateral microscopy, getting a very high magnification photo showing the lateral posterior edge, standardized <coughs> magnification. Then we project in this image with a um, program that's used by architects. Uh, a circle that had a known radius based on the size of the lens epithelial cells. And with that, what we were measuring is how much of that edge, lateral posterior edge, deviates from a perfect square. So of course, the higher the number, less the square is the edge. So let us compare these in the IOLs, their market as square edge lenses. And we were very surprised. So you can see the numbers in yellow there. There is a huge variation of what is called square edge lenses. And here are the images. So believe me or not, all of these lenses here were equally sold in the market as the square edge lenses. But you just glance at the, the images and you see that they are definitely not the same. For the silicone lenses, the same thing. Some were very square, very, very good, but others, not so much. So again, a huge difference in what the marketing was calling square edges, and nobody was really controlling that. And of course, there is the shrimp wrapping of the capsule bag, of the IOL by the capsule bag, and if the capsule bag contracts, you enhance the contact between the optic with the posterior capsule. That may, makes this, may make these differences in edge a little bit less important, but I mean, it's just up to some extent. Some of these differences are very, very important. And then the third part of the study got really worse because then we, uh, this, uh, we evaluated the hydrophilic acrylic lenses, which are not so popular here in the United States, but you do have some. But in Europe, they are very popular. So we got a lot of hydrophilic acrylic lenses and we did the same thing. But we used an environmental scanning electron microscopy to not dehydrate the IOLs while they were checked. Because if you, lem if you remember from yesterday, the water content of these lenses may be from 18% and up. So if you really dehydrate the lenses, what you may be seeing in terms of edge may not be the final product, right? So we try to keep that not dehydrated. And we were totally surprised. It's even worse. So these are all lenses in the market that I sold as square edge lenses. So you look at the edges, and some of them do not look square at all. And what happens with these lenses is that they are manufacturing the dry state. So the edges are cut in the dry state. 
And then what the companies do, they take these beautiful SEM photographs of the lenses dehydrated and then they put in these booklets and it looks very square. But however, when you hydrate the lenses, they do not look like that. They look like this. And why is this important? Because as a whole, if you consider silicone, hydrophobic acrylic, and hydrophilic acrylic lenses, as a whole in terms of groups, all the lenses are not the same, but as a group, the hydrophilic acrylic lenses will have much less square edges than the hydrophobic acrylic and the silicone. And if you check the literature, you find a lot of papers, here's just some examples, where the authors are saying, okay, this is a clinical study comparing two square edge lenses. One is hydrophobic acrylic, one is hydrophilic acrylic, and we just want to see what's the effect of the material. And then the hydrophilic acrylic always have the worst PCO ever, and they are like, oh my god, hydrophilic acrylic material is very bad and everything, but they were not comparing apples to apples. Yep. There is something in the manufacturing process that does not really make this practical or even possible in some cases. So that's the thing. In the sequence of the manufacturing, and I visit some of them in Germany, you have to do that dehydrated. Then later, in the last steps, you hydrate the lens. There is issue with uh, contamination by bacteria. There is issue with sterilization also. So in the process, that's not what you do. You do dry, and then you hydrate. But it makes a huge difference. In the literature, you have all these papers published in very good journals, arriving to conclusions that are totally not valid because they are not comparing apples to apples, right? So you should do an analysis of the edge before you enter in a study like that to make sure that you are comparing something that's comparable and the only variable is the material. So if someone says hydrophilic acrylic lenses have the worst PCO, I mean, it's not the material. Maybe just that the edge is totally not square at all. Okay. So another interesting point that we figure out also in rabbit studies and also in cadaver eye studies, and that's something you can clearly see in clinics when you check patients under slit lamp. So you know that those single piece lenses became so popular because they are so easy to inject and manipulate and everything. So when there was a transition from three piece to single piece, the way the PCO form became different because this lens here, for example, has the square edge all around, including in the haptics. However, if you analyze the optic haptic junction, it's going to be a very smooth ride for the lens epithelial cells. So there is no barrier actually here, and because the, the haptics are so thick, you are not going to have in this location a fusion between anterior and posterior capsule outside of the edge. So it's very easy for the lens epithelial cells to migrate here. So with these single piece lenses, the PCO almost always is at the optic haptic junction. So we check that in the rabbit, and then in our collection of cadaver eyes, that's exactly what you see. So everything here is clear, and here's where the PCO is just starting at the optic haptic junction. Here again, histopathology showing the same. Here the same thing, PCO is starting here, PCO is starting right there. And with the three-piece lenses, we did this study showing that if you analyze where the PCO starts, would mostly be where the capsular axis edge is not covering the periphery of the optic. So the pattern of PCO initiation is also different. However, the incidence, some studies checked, does not change much. It's, the, it's just the way if you have PCO where it really starts. So we did some interesting studies. This is a hydrophilic acrylic lens made by Rayner. It's actually available in the United States, the center flex. And at the very uh, beginning of this lens, that was the design, and there was a very smooth transition between the optic and the haptics here. So same thing, PCO would always start right there. So the company decided to change just that specific region. They added an extra step there, as you can see here. And sure enough, prevention of PCO was much better. We did that in rabbit eyes, and later all the authors confirmed in clinical studies. So it really makes a big difference. Okay, so now let us start talking about things that are not really standard, right? So what is the standard so far that I told you? You have an IOL like here, 
you, you open your anterior capsule, you did your anterior capsular axis, you evacuated the capsular bag, and then you put the eyewear inside of the bag. That's the standard. In this, we want a shrink wrapping of the, of the uh, IOL by the capsule. But Marie José Tassignon in Belgium decided to do something totally different. She decided to organize the capsular bag as a function of her IOL. So she designed an IOL that's very different. It's called the bag in the lens IOL. So in the surgery, you do the anterior capsular axis and then you do a posterior capsular axis of the same size, and then you put the IOL, there is a groove on the periphery for 360 degrees, and you fit the residual edge of the anterior and posterior capsule right there. So then, with this, she pretty much eliminates posterior capsule opacification. And I want to show you some images because um, a few years ago, she had some patients die of cancer, and she got them to donate the eyes for her for research after their death, and then she sent the eyes here. So this is the first one, and actually this was from an ophthalmologist, so it was very, very interesting. So you see here the IOL inside of the capsular bag. This is perfectly clear because the fact is there is no posterior capsule right there. So in this eye, if you do the pathology, we saw a residual outline of the IOL here, and you have here the groove, and you see anterior and posterior capsules directed to that groove. So later, she sent other eyes that had longer follow-up, and you can see that in the residual capsular bag, there is a lot of summary ring formation. Again, this is residual pearls, uh, lens epithelial cells that form pearls, the residual cortical material that proliferates, and summary's ring is at the origin of posterior capsular pacification. But as this is confined in the equatorial region because anterior and, and posterior capsule are inside of the groove of the IOL, there is no way this material can migrate to the area behind the IOL. So even though you have this huge summary's ring formation, PCO is zero. And this is what she uses in all her patients, especially in all the pediatric population, because you know the pediatric population, if you do not take some extra measures in the surgery, PCO is going to be 100%. So she doesn't have PCO. However, this is not exactly a very easy technique to implant. She trains her personnel, so everybody's very nicely trained in, in uh, her department for that, so they do this routinely, so for them it becomes very easy, but for surgeons uh, worldwide to adopt that, that's not very easy. Did she talk about risks of vitreous migration? Say it again. Did she talk about risks of vitreous migration? You know, she discussed that with the buttonhole technique by Rupert Menapache and everything, but with this lens, it seems it's pretty much okay. She didn't see that because the material cannot escape that area here. So there is a um, fibrotic tissue that forms between the edge of the anterior and posterior capsule inside of the groove, and that becomes sealed. So the material remains there. So now we talked about uh, Marie José Tassignon lenses, and then I would like to talk about these IOL designs maintaining an open or expanded capsular bag. So we started working with some lenses in our laboratory and suddenly we are like, these are behaving very, very different. So in 2010, they created a whole symposium on this and we were talking about that. And I think I will use just this specific project to elaborate a little bit on what is that. So since many years we have been studying this round lens, this shaped lens, which it has these rings, the, the lens is suspended between haptic rings, is a hydrophilic acrylic lens. And at the beginning they gave us this drawing and say, okay, when you put the lens in the rabbit, it's probably going to look like that. The optic will be posterior in contact with the posterior capsule, but the anterior capsule uh, rex is going to be floating, there is not going to contact the IOL, so you are not going to have anterior capsule opacification. So this is a rabbit eye five weeks after implantation. This is a high-frequency ultrasound that you use for the anterior segment, and that's exactly what we saw. So we started doing some small preliminary studies with a few rabbits, short-term studies, like up to five, sometimes six weeks. 
and uh, this lens will be implanted in one eye, and the other eye will have a standard single piece hydrophobic acrylic lens. And the difference was so impressive that we were like, we, we never actually saw that. So of course in the rabbit eye is an accelerated model for PCO. Six to eight weeks in the rabbit model, maybe more than two years in a human eye in terms of lens epithelial cells proliferating. So in the rabbit eye, as you give time, it's just like the capsular bag fills up again. And look at the difference with the test eye. No PCO and the anterior capsular axis is absolutely clear. So here you have from the posterior view and all the scoring was very significant in terms of difference. And when you do the full histopathology, the only place we saw some uh, proliferation was in a very limited area between the two rings. Otherwise, nothing else. Everything else was clear, anterior and posterior capsule. So this was the first design. And then in the second design, they changed including uh, holes on the lateral edge here because there was that hypothesis at the time, starting at the time, that if you leave the capsular bag open and the aqueous humor can flow all around the inside compartment of the capsular bag, you actually prevent capsular bag opacification. So this one had a much better flow of aqueous humor and sure enough, we put in other rabbit study, in another rabbit study, very small study, short term, and the prevention of posterior capsular pacification and anterior capsular pacification was even better with not even limited proliferation at the equatorial region of the capsular bag. And in that particular study, something very interesting happened. So they gave us the lens, and the lens had no uh, mark or anything, so it was very difficult to load in the cartridge and to know what was anterior and posterior surface. So I was loading at the time, I probably screwed up. And then that how you normally see in the ultrasound a standard IOL, that how you should see this lens with the optic posterior and no anterior capsule touching the IOL. And in this study, two of those lenses end up upside down. So the optic, instead of being down in the posterior capsule, was up. So there was zero contact between the optic and the posterior capsule. So what did I tell at the beginning? That the contact between the optic and the posterior capsule is very important for PCO. So you would conclude, okay, so it was horrible for PCO. No, it was zero. So with this configuration of the round uh, disc shape design, the capsular bag being open with the aqueous uh, flowing inside of the capsular bag, the contact between the optic and the posterior capsule is not even necessary. So this changed completely our universe, you know, because it's really a shift in way to think. So very interesting. And now you have this study that's impressed because when you have a new IOL, new material, the ISO standards, the international standards require the company to perform six month studies. And the fellows will tell you that when we do six month studies in the rabbit, it is horrible because after the second month, there is so much proliferation inside of the capsular bag that almost like the proliferation starts pushing the optic out. You have pupillary optic capture, you have synechia, the eyes look horrible. So it's just a question of having a control. As far as the control look as horrible as the test, we are pretty much okay. So we did the six month study and this is what you see. I mean, PCO was scored as zero at six months in a rabbit model. That's unheard of. That's extremely impressive. So you see here the control with partial pupillary optic capture, a lot of proliferation and do, this is looking really good. And most important, look at the histopath. So you have the control here. The capsular bag is filled with material. Where it's empty here is because the IOL was here and the IOL was actually dissolved during the preparation. So you have a capsular bag that's full with material again. And here's the test. I mean, the anterior capsule is here, totally clear, posterior capsule. The bag is very expanded. You see nothing. So this is literally unheard of. This is very interesting. We have another project, this accommodating IOL. Is also bulky and, and keeps the capsular bag expanded. It does not really keep the capsular bag open that the, the aqueous can go around, but it really keeps the bag very under tension and expanded. So that's the lens that has silicone oil inside of the large haptics 
doing effort for accommodation. This is squeezed and then the silicon oil goes to the optic and you have some accommodation. Clinical studies are underway for this lens. And we did short-term studies and long-term studies. And again, the same thing. You see the control just going south very, very badly. And the test eye looks really nice. You see from a Miyake view at two months, you can see at six months, look at the difference. And here's again the histopathology. Very limited proliferation there, otherwise very expanded and clean. And here you have huge proliferation. So now uh, just to finalize, we talk about anterior capsular pacification, essentially fibrotic, posterior capsular pacification, surgical factors that you can use to prevent it, IOL factors that you can use to prevent it. We talked about these out of the bag, you know, concepts, out of, uh, out of the box concepts, like the bag in the lens that change the relationship between the lens and the bag, and these new IOLs that instead of keeping the bag very collapsed around the IOL, actually do the contrary and keep the bag very open. And now to finalize, we'll talk about interlenticular pacification. We don't see much of that anymore, but it's important for you to know because the piggyback procedure is becoming quite popularized because if you have, for example, a refractive surprise, instead of explaining to the lens, you can just get an IOL and put in the sulcus as a piggyback lens, a supplementary lens. And if you have two lenses in the eye, you have to think, am I going to have interlenticular pacification or not? So basically, this is your pacification uh, between both lenses that were in the bag. And if you think how this is formed, the material that comes from the equatorial region, the summary's ring, instead of going behind the optic of the lens forming PCO, if you have two lenses in the bag, that material may go in between the lenses and form ILO. It's the same material, it's the same cells, it's the same origin. It's just that it goes inside of the capsular bag between the lenses. All the cases we analyzed is related to, were related to two uh, three-piece hydrophobic acrylic lenses implanted in the bag with a small capsular axis covering the edge of the anterior lens for 360 degrees, and all of them were Acrosoft lenses. So I particularly believe that the Acrosoft has this adhesive surface. Then the material starts entering in between and it attaches to the IOL, and they have like a scaffold to keep growing and growing because some surgeons even put two silicone lenses in the bag in this configuration and they did not see this problem of interlenticular pacification. So I, see, I think the attachment of the material to the surface is important. But then you cannot even detach the lens one from the other. It was really horrible. And that's what was happening. You have two lenses in the bag and these cells that start proliferating instead of going behind will go in between. So there are some surgical methods proposed to prevent this complication. If you would put two lenses in the bag, it would be better if you do a larger capsular axis, larger than the optic, because then that anterior capsule would fuse with the posterior capsule and sequester the residual cells to the equatorial region. But the second one is really the most popular one. You would still have one IOL in the bag via a smaller capsular axis but the anterior lens will be placed in the sulcus. And then you would not have a space, a real space in between <coughs> because this, is, this here is sealed with the one standard IOL in the bag. And that's what mostly surgeons do nowadays with refractive surprises that then they put an IOL in the sulcus. However, I want to remind you that you cannot put any intraocular lens in the sulcus. You really have to pay attention. <coughs> so uh, some three-piece lenses with lower power, they have square edges not only on the posterior surface, they also have square edges on the anterior surface, and they may have a lateral edge that's not polished, so it's very rough. If you put this type of three-piece lens in the sulcus, you may have a very important problem uh, of UGH syndrome, uveitis, glaucoma, hyphema syndrome, with a lot of pigmentary dispersion and even pigmentary glaucoma because of that. So you have to select an IOL for the sulcus that has smooth surfaces and uh, round and polished and, and smooth anterior optic edges. 
And of course, we always have to remind you, the single piece that resolves and all the single piece lenses like that, they have anterior and posterior square edges, at least the Acrisoft does. And the square edges on the haptics, the haptics are very thick. The side walls are very unpolished, very hot. You should not put this IOL in the sulcos at any circumstances. So you always should pay attention to that. So we had cases with a lot of pigmentary dispersion. Okay, so. The research on prevention of capsular bag opacification is really increasing in importance now because of uh, especially these accommodating lens. There are so many accommodating IOL projects going on there. Some very interesting, some very crazy, but all of them that we test, this is a very important problem. The bag has to remain stable. If the bag starts proliferating cells and fibrotic tissue and opacifying, it, it really kills those interesting projects. So it's not only PCO anymore. It's especially, I would say, ACO, because ACO, anterior capsule opacification, is an essentially fibrotic entity. So you really have to think about the capsular bag as a whole. Now you have to prevent any fibrosis inside of the capsular bag because of that. When we talk about these IOL designs maintaining the bag open and expanded, we, we may see a shift in the future towards those things because we are very surprised with the results. There is not only less anterior and posterior capsule opacification, even when you see the summer's ring formation, there is less proliferation there, and that may be because of different mechanisms, and one of them is down here. So Dr. Nishi believes that if you have an aqueous humor that can freely go inside of the capsule bag and wash the inner compartment of the capsule bag, this is going to prevent some cytokines to reach a certain level. Uh, and these are the cytokines that stimulate lens epithelial cell proliferation, but if they not uh, reach that concentration, this process is going to be stopped. So this is a very important concept, deserves further investigation. Again, we are very, very surprised with our results. Thank you very much. If you have any other question. Okay, everybody understood everything. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you.